Good evening, everybody. My name is Jayatri Das. I'm chief bioscientist here at the Franklin Institute. Welcome to the latest installment of our ongoing speaker series, where we tackle current topics in science and technology and think about the roles they play in our everyday lives. It's an opportunity not just to learn about some emerging science, but also to think about the choices that we all make for ourselves, for our communities, and for our societies. So we're delighted to have you join us today for a really important conversation about technology in our lives and how we understand and manage the risks and the benefits. It's an honor to be joined by Dr. Pablo Molina, from, who's a Chief Information Security Officer at Drexel University. He brings a really diverse set of perspectives on the technical aspects of things, the, um, the ethical aspects of things, and as well as some of the policy issues as well. It's a complicated issue, and we're lucky to have him here to help us understand it. But what I find fascinating about this issue is it's really this intersection of psychology and technology um, and, and, and the role that, that human nature plays in all of this. But before we go down that avenue um, in a couple of different directions, I wanted to ask you first to kind of level the playing field for those of us who are not in technology and have some, maybe have some questions about that first stage of your cycle of innovation. Um, with these technologies, we do hear a lot of terms being thrown around like artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus deep learning. Um, can you help us understand what the distinctions between those terms are? Um, I'm going to start by saying, for those of you who have a technical background, that the main difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning is that machine learning is usually written in a programming language, whereas artificial intelligence is usually written in PowerPoint. <laughs> Basically, it means that there's a lot, a lot of hype about artificial intelligence. They have some really good efforts by IBM, Google, and many other companies, uh, but there's also a lot of hype. It was uh, recently published in the European Union that any company that is trying to secure uh, venture capital who uses the words artificial intelligence and blockchain in whatever uh, explanation they're giving about their business, that they're going to get at least 50% more funding than companies that do the same without those keywords. But in, on a more serious matter, artificial intelligence is basically the idea of uh, computers or other technology devices behaving, uh, doing things that are intelligent. Now, whether this is human intelligence or machine intelligence is debatable, but machines are doing now things that we thought they couldn't do before. Um, there was a test for this called the Turing test, uh, which Alan Turing created, and the test which was only uh, passed by a machine in 2014 was the idea that a person communicates with two entities that are sitting behind closed doors with written responses. And based on the responses, the person had to decide which one was a machine and which one was a person. And the scientists in the United Kingdom were able to fool uh, and pass the test by impersonating a 13-year-old boy uh, with a computer. Now, I question whether a 13-year-old boy really is an intelligent being. That is not clear to me, but it was the first time that they passed this. So there is an umbrella term, artificial intelligence. Within artificial intelligence, we have machine learning. Machine learning is the idea that you're going to release a computer onto a set of data or rules, and the computer is going to learn by itself. So an example are some of the, for example, some of the new chess plain um, computer programs. Unlike the ones that were designed before by IBM when they were able to beat the world champion uh, Kasparov, the ones now play among themselves until they master the game. The same is true for an even more complicated game, which is the game of Go, originally from Asia. And once again, the computers are so good at learning how to play these things after playing millions and billions of games among themselves that they become real experts. Within machine learning, there's even a smaller subset, which is called deep learning. And deep learning uses a special technique for this learning process using what I'll call neural networks. And it's the idea that you're going to make connections in between pieces of information 
akin to what we do ourselves when we use our neurons in order to think and process information. Thank you. I think that that's really helpful in sort of setting up the hierarchy of this terminology and helping us understand um, how these terms are used. I wanted to start with security, since that's kind of your area of, of um, application in particular, is that you, you gave us some examples of um, how, how our security is challenged at an individual level. You also talked about how, you know, at, at an institutional level, you're charged with keeping a whole network safe. What are the similarities and differences in the risks that we face at these, at these two levels when you think about something like Quest Diagnostics versus what we're looking at with our own personal bank accounts? Mm -hmm. Well, although this is not true, but it's a good story. Um, they, they once asked ask, uh, bank robber, why did he rob banks? And the answer was, that's where the money is. Um, so it's similar. The cyber criminals are going to try the most lucrative targets with the least effort. So when it comes to, for example, uh, having a good cybersecurity defense for an organization like Drexel University, well, we look at it from two points of view. One of them is, sure, we want to keep the bad guys away. But also very important, we just want to have more defenses that other organizations in the certain space so that the bad guys go after the others. <laughs> it's the old saying of you don't have to run faster than a lion, you just have to run faster than your partners as you're running away from the lion. So, and because we all have this uh, approach, um, it makes sometimes uh, difficult the coordination of efforts across organizations. The interesting part is that organizations have much more resources. Drexel has a chief information security officer and also has uh, some cybersecurity employees. I made some of them come here. So, and also have fantastic students who are studying cybersecurity at Drexel, who are going to join many organizations and develop their professional careers with them. You don't have this at home. At most, you're going to have a little bit of help from your internet service provider and not much. Can you invest in having all of these cybersecurity efforts? You're not, so if the bad guys can get to you and it's not difficult, they can make a lot of money if they steal a few dollars from millions of people versus stealing a few million dollars from a bank. And I think they're gonna try both. And even though it's different, it means that everybody has to be alert. Now here's an interesting part where technology companies have a big responsibility. I don't have time at home to make sure that my Alexa device is patched and up to date and my wireless router is patched and up to date, and all my devices are patched and up to date. That takes too long for anybody who needs to do all the things in life. So I believe that technology companies should be more responsible. They should program their devices and their technology better so that they have less security flaws. And part of the reason why they don't do it is because they don't have an incentive to do it because we're not willing to pay much more for those devices because it's an economic decision, and they are not forced by any regulation to make them more secure. On top of that, in this country, as well as many others, there's no right of private action for many of these problems. If a computer device malfunctions or is insecure and leaks your information, if one of the companies uh, leaks your information, in most cases, the most they're going to get is a fine from a regulator. But you, as a consumer, will not see much. You can join a class action lawsuit and sue Facebook for privacy violations. So, so that's, a, that's a good transition to thinking about how privacy and security are, are interrelated, is that on one hand, you know, we, we need to have that security. On the other hand, there's a convenience factor of, you know, how much attention that we pay to it in the middle of all of the things that else, all, all the other things that we have to pay attention to. And you know, we see these trade-offs in all of these different spheres that we're talking about. Um, and, and, and thinking about privacy, you, know, you mentioned at the, at the end of your talk about how you know, we, we hear about all of the risks to our privacy, but there are also huge benefits that come from giving up some of that privacy. In your work, what do you see as the pros and cons that people tend to value when we're thinking about these choices? Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, part 
of the difficulty in making those decisions is the lack of information that we have. When companies like Facebook do things with our data that are not what they tell us they do with the privacy policy, then we're all surprised. And the interesting part, I'm an expert, and I don't even have time myself to read the privacy policy. How many of you have read an entire privacy policy? Yeah, I thought so. You know, a couple of weird people here, so good for you. Good for you. I don't have time. Not only that, I don't have time. They change constantly. At one point in time, there was an article evaluating the privacy policy of Facebook over time, and it grew by thousands of words. So you can't even understand the privacy policies of these companies. So that would be one of the, of the reasons that creates a, a problem here. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I've given interviews about, oh, after every Facebook scandal, some of the reporters will ask, how do you get out of Facebook? Which is not easy to do. Disconnecting from Facebook, deleting your information, archiving it is not an easy process for obvious reasons. And after I explained to the reporter, yes, you do this, you do that, you save the information, and they ask me, so Pablo, are you still on Facebook? I am. I am because I cannot remember the birth dates of my friends. And it's very important for me to say happy birthday. So I need Facebook. I just want Facebook to be a little bit more ethical. And not ethical only because they may face multi-billion dollar fines for privacy violations or for antitrust uh, uh, misbehavior, but because it's the right thing to do. We're seeing this with companies like Apple. Apple may still make mistakes, they all do. But Apple, the CEO is telling you privacy is important in every forum, and they're trying to do this in every single forum. In the case of the San Bernardino shooters, nobody wants the shooters to go away. We all want to help law enforcement. When law enforcement ask Apple to say, give me all the information in the cloud for these terrorists, Apple gave it right away because it was done with a judicial order in process of law. However, when law enforcement ask Apple, I want you to write a backdoor so we can get into the last hour of information that is in the device of the terrorist. Important messages were maybe they contacted other cells and said, now is your turn to go ahead. That information is very important. But Apple fought building that backdoor because once they build that backdoor for the FBI in the United States, anybody can ask for the same backdoor in other countries and the bad guys can find the backdoor. So Apple said, I cannot do it. I will not do it. Now, in the end, the FBI was able to buy a technology from, um, I believe, an Israeli company and was able to crack that particular iPhone and find the information. So there's an audience question that's actually related to that point that you just made, is you know, how do we regulate law enforcement buying the data to circumvent those warrant requirements? Can't hear the question. Oh, is my mic on? Sorry. Sorry about that. Is that better? Thank you. Um, so the question that from the audience that relates to the point that you just made is how, do we, how could we regulate law enforcement actually buying data to circumvent those warrant requirements? Well, it's, it's very important to, to regulate law enforcement because even though their mission is to protect the public in different ways, we've learned over the years that sometimes law enforcement will uh, overstep and will step on our civil liberties. Um, I think there's a great example that you brought up before with face recognition. There is a software from Amazon called Recognition with a K. And this software is being sold to governments in many parts of the world for law enforcement. Now, they can't sell it in San Francisco because San Francisco banned by municipal law the acquisition of this technology. Even a group of activist shareholders for Amazon two weeks ago tried to pass a resolution by which the company could no longer sell that technology to government. The resolution didn't pass because stockholders like to make money, and this is why they decided to do this. But think about the dangers of facial recognition. The American Civil Liberties Union last year decided, I'm going to try this recognition software. I'm going to feed to this software the pictures of the members of Congress. They did. And it turns out that the software identified 28 of them as people who had been arrested before. Now, I'm sure some of them had been arrested before, <laughs> but not 28 of them. So imagine the problem with all these false positives. 
And also imagine how they can use this to curtail our privacy. If you want to go to a mm, dive bar in Philadelphia, where you want to have the citywide special without anybody knowing because you're not supposed to be there, with facial recognition, people can find out each and every one of your movements. And whereas we want to protect um, the people of this country, we also want to have our freedom. We don't want to live in a police state when there's no freedom to do anything that doesn't involve going to work, going to church, going to the gym, and visiting your mom. So I, I want to talk about facial recognition technology a little bit more because I think it's, in addition to the questions about privacy, it's also really illustrative of some issues with bias and algorithms. So I can't remember if it was the same ACLU study that, that looked at this, um, but there are tests that have been done on facial recognition technology that show that the recognition is actually better for whites and males than they are for women and people of color. And so when you have these types of algorithms then being applied in, um, you know, not just for facial recognition technology, but also in ways that are you being used in the criminal justice system, you have these human biases now being, you know, coded into these, what we tend to perceive as, you know, unbiased um, computers. Where do you see this issue um, you know, developing as, as awareness of these biases emerge? What are the fixes out there and what, what does it mean for the applications of the technology? Um, it's an excellent question and one of the most worrying um, issues when it comes to artificial intelligence in general, when machines are making decisions that before were made by human because humans program those machines. And humans, accidentally or on purpose, can pass their biases to those machines. So oftentimes, the people who develop these technologies are middle-aged white men. Hence, they start testing with that. They pay attention to that. They do not pay attention to all the diverse people we have in this country and in other countries. And with this, you have the bias. And the bias results in inconvenience because there's an automatic system, for example, to go through customs, but it doesn't recognize you because you have a uni an unusual face or a skin color or because of some other, or because you have tattoos or some other body piercings that modified your appearance that you chose to, to have. Biases are even more worrisome when it comes to large scale processing. During the mortgage uh, recession that we had, um, we've known that Wells Fargo was using an algorithm to decide which ones of the people who were having problems paying their mortgages would qualify for a new federal program that would allow them to keep their houses. And because the algorithm was not well programmed, thousands of people lost their houses. So, and this is why, for example, last year as a member of the Electronic Privacy Information Center and civil society, a coalition of civil society organizations, we released some principles for artificial intelligence last year. We unveiled them in Brussels, and many academics and organizations have signed those principles. The idea in those principles, there are many of them, but you can imagine some of them are transparency. I want to know whether it's a computer or a person, the one who's making a decision. I want to know, while preserving trade secrets and commercial intellectual property, I want to know what are the factors that are being used in order to make those decisions. I want to have the ability to question that decision, to appeal a decision to a human being in case there's been an algorithmic problem. These are some basic tenets that we passed on those resolutions. Working with this organization as well, then we went to the Organization for Economic Cooperation of Development, which is a supranational meeting of governments for economic growth. And we discussed in Paris artificial intelligence guidelines, and they released their own. And in their own, which are meant for economic growth, they also understood the importance of having not only these issues that I discussed before, but also a very important one. Somebody has to be responsible for the deeds of artificial intelligence machines. If a self-driving car causes an accident, somebody has to be legally liable for that particular accident. 
And these are very important things that we're wrestling with. As the technology is not yet mature, for once, we're trying to envision many of the problems before they become really serious problems. So on, on that theme, um, another question from the audience is, you know, who should we fear most intruding into our privacy, you know, the government or large corporations? <laughs> and I want to maybe also throw out uh, the, the converse of that is, who do we trust and why? And this question came to my mind because we were recently talking to some um, folks who are experimenting with new ways of medical, re uh, medical monitoring, I guess, of patient monitoring via text message to try and maintain chronic health conditions. Um, and when they experimented with doing text-based monitoring of you know, data coming in from you know, like a Fitbit type of, um, of wearable technology, people were totally willing to give up levels of information that I would not have expected them to. But I think that gets to the idea this is that you're just talking about is that, you know, what are some principles that do engender that trust? And, you know, what types of organizations are more likely to do that versus some of these, you know, these big um, government and large corporations that, that might play a little bit more fast and loose? Well, I think we should, uh, we should fear all. Yes, uh, <laughs> but it's very interesting. As I spent significant time in Europe, I realized there is a big difference between the United States and Europe when it comes to privacy. So in the US, we are more concerned about privacy invasion by the government. You know, when you look at the Fourth Amendment, which is against unreasonable search and seizure, which is the basis for most of the privacy regulations in this country, at least the, the philosophical basis. The main reason for this is to avoid, prevent the government from getting unnecessarily into our affairs. This way we have judicial review, for example, of uh, wiretap orders or some other investigative techniques that are important in order to catch the bad people. And we, for example, were surprised when Snowden revealed that indeed the National Security Administration which did not have the right to spy on American citizens, was spying on American citizens, was collecting the phone call information from every single citizen they could in the United States. And this was deemed illegal by the courts in the United States, and the NSA had to redo the program in a way that was much more suitable to respect the civil liberties and the privacy of US citizens. On the other hand, in Europe, they just passed the most advanced regulation for privacy, the general data protection regulation. And it's very interesting, what is the regulation applies also to government organizations, really the intent of the regulation is against corporations. Because in Europe, people trust their governments with their information. I have to carry a national identity card when I'm in Spain. It's a requirement for everybody. There's not such a thing in the United States. We use our driver's licenses in lieu of that but there's never been a national identity card that you're forced to obtain and produce to any law enforcement officer for any reason, not without probable cause. So, and once again, we see that one of the best legislations ever passed for privacy was in this country. In 1974 was the Federal Privacy Act, and it was precisely to avoid that all the government agencies could collect information about the, all the citizens and build a big database in order to know what each one of, that, of us do. So there are these cultural differences mm -hmm. that, that we see. Um, and, I, and I'm sure if, as we expand even beyond you know, the US and Europe into Asia, there are different cultural standards there as well. Um, so you've been an advocate for increasing diversity in you know, the technological workforce. Um, how do you see that you know, maybe addressing some of these issues about bias and, and, and cultural attitudes by, by diversifying the, the people who are engaged in developing the technology? Um, the interesting part is people are the ones who put on the technology. You can imagine that if you are hiring all the people with the same background of similar ages, the same race, from the same part of the country as you would see in many of the Silicon Valley companies with a vast majority of middle age or young white males, then you're missing on understanding what are the needs for the rest of the population. And 
Part of the problem with hiring for diverse candidates is the pipeline. Traditionally, many less women than men have gone into science, technology, engineering, and math careers. Hence, because there's not a pipeline, it's harder for them to get to those programming jobs and those executive jobs. This is even more compounded for people who are uh, minorities, African American, for example, uh, people, Hispanics. Um, all of those need to uh, go through the pipeline of the education system, but then the companies need to understand that it makes sense to hire those because they can really target all of those consumers. In the end, they can actually make more money and do the right thing. It's very interesting, I have a neighbor here in Philadelphia who graduated from Drexel. Uh, he has um, uh, spine uh, bifida. Um, you know, he has to have a walker and he has a very funny YouTube uh, monologue where he's uh, sharing how he bought an Apple Watch. And the Apple Watch uh, calculates how much you're moving by the swinging of your arms. Well, he's always on the walker. So <laughs> the Apple Watch says, you're not moving much these days, are you? <laughs> and it says, this would be a great time to go for a walk or a run. And you can see how these things are not only insulting, but with a little bit better thinking, you can take into account not only those diverse populations, but also the people, for example, who are hearing impaired, people who are visually impaired, people who can talk, um, as well as people, the elderly, which sooner or later will include each and every one of us. So I think it's a, that's a great shout out to a lot of STEM education initiatives that are really trying to reach um, you know, kids, especially who, who might not have you know, had a path to these careers before. Um, thinking about kids, and you know, they're, they're some of the ones who are you know, probably embedded in some of this technology you know, from, from childhood. Um, there's a question from the audience for asking for suggestions on how to encourage kids to be safe online. Um, there is a big social distinction um, by age between what we call digital natives and digital immigrants. Many of us are digital immigrants. We grew up when computers were not available or mobile phones. Hence, we came into the digital world later from an analog world. But younger generations are digital natives. To them, there's always been the internet, always computers, and always phones. And the interesting part, as these kids get into more and more technology offerings, games like Fortnite that many kids uh, play, uh, social networks, even though they switch from one to another based on demographic preferences, they will be exposed to many of these risks. And the way to do it would be very similar to the way we've educated children to not go into, a car, into the car of a stranger, unless it's Uber or Lyft, uh, <laughs> to not go into a stranger's home unless it's Airbnb, for example. You know, we need to educate our kids to have uh, their critical thinking skills. Um, I would argue that schools could do more. I would argue that digital hygiene uh, should be, and cybersecurity and privacy should be a things taught in the school as well, not only voluntary by parents and civil society organizations, because these are critical skills, because the kids uh, the young generations need to be able to protect their own information, but also they need to think very carefully about how to protect the information of the organizations where they work, the information entrusted to them. So the interesting part is not only that we all have to do our critical thinking and use our brains and everything else, but also the technology companies and the content providers have to do their part. Let's look, for example, at fake news. Suddenly, Facebook was surprised that it was fake news on its platform. Excuse me, your business is to know what's on your platform so you can sell it to advertisers. Perhaps you decide not to do anything because of the money, but also because of the complexities around censorship and freedom of speech, which are certainly very challenging issues. But some of the things that are doing now are the right things to do. Transparency. We need to be able, for those things that are circulating online, on one platform or another, we need to know, all right, who's behind this news story? Are these Russian trolls from St. Petersburg who are publishing information that vaccines are bad for you? Or are these people who are dividing the US population 
uh, because um, they claim that some officers want to take away your right to bear arms. Knowing the source of this information will help us make a better informed decision. And this is why it takes a village. It takes each and every one of us. It takes the technology companies. It also takes the regulators in order to make sure that we have a safer online environment. I'm very worried, for example, about those kids who have fallen victim to, as I mentioned before, uh, some sort of revenge porn or sextortion scam where they are targeted by online predators. Because you could tell before, you know, it's 10 a.m., it's 10 p.m., you know where your children are. Well, now it could be 4 p.m. on the bad guys are in your living room, in your computer, in your phone, and the kids don't know how bad those people are. So it's very important to educate them and alert them so that they are, can defend themselves against these particular threats. So along those lines, um, we have a question asking if you have any resources that you recommend for us non-techie people um, to help us think about how to set up systems to protect our privacy and security. Mm -hmm. um, a number of resources. When it comes to, to crime, there's the Internet Complaint Crime Center. The FBI also has fantastic resources on the issue of crime. When it comes to uh, using the technology, regrettably or fortunately, the best resources come from the companies that are providing these resources. And the companies have realized that this is important. So for example, how many of you have a Gmail account? Okay, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> All right. So it's very interesting, uh, Gmail, will tell you that you can set up two-factor authentication. That means that in order to log in to your uh, Gmail account, you're going to need two things. Something that you know, which is your password, and something that you have, which may be your mobile phone that gets a code sent to you. Enable, enabling multi-factor authentication is very important. Now, Google doesn't make it mandatory. We're making it mandatory in most of the organizations because we can't afford that if you made a mistake and click on the wrong link and enter your credentials, we cannot afford for the bad guys to use that in order to siphon out all the information of the people we served. So for that, we make it mandatory. And the same way the organizations are making it mandatory, I recommend that you consider making it mandatory also for yourselves, for Facebook, for Google, for anything that can be used to poach information from you, consider enabling multi-factor or two-factor authentication. As you can see, Every time you do an important financial transaction, you're already asked by the bank for two-factor authentication. They send you a code to the phone because they want to make sure that somebody's not walking away with your money, which they sometimes do. So on these sort of everyday tips that we can all use, um, another question is, you know, as you know, we always hear that you shouldn't use the same web, the same password across different websites, and we end up with you know 50 million different passwords. Uh, what's the best way to manage all of that information? Um, <clears throat> well, I have a I have a, a, a beer glass <laughs> that reads, "I am a security officer, and I drink because password is your password." <laughs> 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 So, which is very appropriate. And it's interesting when we look at passwords, for example, a number of years ago, they look at the most common passwords and they discovered that the most common password was one, two, three, four, five. And then they looked again three or four years ago and they discovered that the most common password was one, two, three, four, five, six. Major improvement, as you can see here. So it's very interesting with passwords because nobody can remember all the passwords that we have for all the different websites. So what most people tend to do is use the same password in a number of websites. Now let's say that somebody planted uh, malware in your computer, a keylogger that keeps track of the keys you play, the you type. If you log in to one particular service, let's say something innocent like a chess platform online to play games, but you use the same password, they can use that in order to get into everything else you have. Bank accounts, medical records, email, absolutely everything you have. And from there they can wreak havoc with your life for identity theft, for stealing information, for stealing money. So this is not a good idea. What are the different possibilities? 
Well, first, when it came to the complexity of passwords, you know the part where sometimes you go to a website and says, you have to have a password that is 355 characters long. <laughs> it must add some Chinese characters. We need some of your genetic code in there, the blood of a virgin, and also a haiku <laughs> poem. I, it's impossible to remember all this. So it turns out that longer passwords are not necessarily complicated. Just a poem line that you like, it's a very strong password, and you can use that. Now, with the issue of many passwords, there are two possibilities. There is the possibility of using what is called a password manager or keeper. There are pieces of software that you buy, some of them are free, some of them you have to pay, that allow you to keep all the passwords. You have one strong master password that protects all of the other passwords. Now it's very interesting, when you get one of those, make sure you get a reputable one, because otherwise there's a backdoor that sends all your credentials already to the bad guys. The other possibility is not that difficult to consider. If you create a password that is unique to you, your combination of letters and numbers in most cases, and then to add to that, you add something that has to do with the particular website that you're using, you are creating a very unique password. So I don't know, you may think, okay, I'm going to add to my password the third letter of the name of the company that I'm using in the middle between the uh, letters and the numbers. That is a good way to have different passwords because the way passwords are hashed is very interesting. The encryption for passwords is quite good has withstand, has withstood the test of time. It takes the entire password, that's a number of conversions, sometimes based on the properties of prime numbers, in order to give you a hashed, a, a converted set of characters that are really what you validate against that. So by changing any single character in a password, you're already changing the resulting hash completely. So when we, we see these, um you know, like Google will say that, oh, I'll store all of your different passwords that I, that, you know, these 16 character passwords in your Google account. Um, you know, how does that play with some of these other systems that you're talking about? Uh, once again, it's, it's a good idea as long as you keep good control of the laptop where you have all of those passwords stored. Uh, and another important thing is for your phones and your laptops, you should have uh, a code always so that other people cannot, if they find or steal your devices, can use all of that information. Um, let's be honest, this is one part where either, uh, you know, fingerprint recognition or face recognition is good for those devices. You know, the phone looks at you, is not sending a copy of your face to the FBI or the NSA or anybody else, is using your face for security within your device. This is something very good. When you think about it, this is also a form of multi-factor authentication because oftentimes you may need a password which is something you know but also you are providing something you have either your fingerprint or your face now interestingly enough i decided to uh, grow my beard not long ago facial recognition doesn't work that well when you change your physical appearance <laughs> So there's another question here that, uh, that, that made me laugh, um, which is, uh, should I destroy my Alexa? <laughs> and I, it, it takes us into the Internet of Things, which we haven't really talked about yet, this interface between the digital world and the physical world. What are your thoughts about the, the risks and the, and the benefits of, of where we're moving with the IoT? I do have one Alexa. We, we have a very complicated relationship. <laughs> it's not always cordial. I think she's jealous of my relationship with Siri as well, so the two of them sometimes uh, get into fights. Uh, what's very worrisome about some of these devices, and one of the television manufacturers already uh, received fines and a consent order for doing this, one of the smart TVs. I'm not sure, maybe Samsung, but I, I don't remember exactly, because the TV was listening all the time. So you're listening to the conversations that are happening in the privacy of your home. And then what do you do with those? You send them back to headquarters. And for what purpose? Well, you can imagine good purposes is to make sure that you, got a, you get a good TV viewing experience. But all this could be to sell you more things, to eavesdrop on what you do. And what does a company that when they're receiving all that information, and suddenly they hear a father who's saying, listen, if you don't shut up, little kid, I'm going to beat you again. Maybe it's an inside joke, 
But to me, it sounds like if that information is there and they pass it to law enforcement, then some bad things could happen. Mm -hmm. So the important thing for all those devices is to make sure that they inform us and they tell us what is it that they're doing with the information. It's very convenient to talk to your device, particularly when you're driving. But I don't want that information to end up in the hands of law enforcement. I don't want that information to be in the hands of advertisers unless I've given my permission to do so. Just because, uh, you know, I'm in my car uh, singing, I don't want to get an advertisement for singing lessons because I know I need them. <laughs> but I just don't want to be reminded by the device. So, so are, are, are some of those clauses buried in that thousand page, you know, thousand page agreement that we sign off to on? Some are, but also in the case of Samsung, they were not, mm -hmm. and they were doing it. And a basic principle here for corporations and for everybody is do as you say, say as you do. So in other words, be transparent about what technology practices you have, and then follow them. And if you want to change them because you realize that your business would be better in other way, then inform the people that you want to change it. Now, you mentioned before about other resources. Oftentimes, because people don't have the resources to examine the privacy policies, to investigate themselves how the technology work, well, this is why oftentimes civil society organizations are very good at this. You know, I serve myself, as I mentioned, the Electronic Privacy Information Center. We, we advocate for people's privacy. We investigate many of these claims. We file claims with the Federal Trade Commission and offer congressional testimony. But there are many others, like the American Civil Liberties Union, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So if you're interested in this topic, Participate. If you want to learn more, for example, uh, about how the internet works and who decides how the internet should operate, join the local chapter of your um, internet society. There are a number of organizations there if you are inclined to participate. And if you don't want to participate in, in person, well, you can still get the benefits of their work. You can still read their website. And sooner or later, you get an, a notification from some of us telling you, hey, could you please contribute? You've been reading our websites for a long time. <laughs> no, actually, we don't track people looking at the website. So. <laughs> Practice what you preach. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, zooming out to some of these more, um, to these bigger questions, um, you know, Pennsylvania in particular is in the middle of thinking about voting machines and security right now. Uh, is it possible to think about you know, how to make our election system safe from hackers? Um, it's a fascinating topic. And the answer is yes, but we need much more time before we can adopt electronic voting. Some countries have tied, tried, Ireland bought a number of uh, machines, and in the first attempts they had to put them away because it was clear that they were not safe. There are three ways to hack an election. Uh, you can hack the voter registration lists. And when you do that, and we know that in the uh, running up to the last presidential election, that hackers infiltrating the rosters of states like Illinois, for example. And when you do that, you could not only post that information in order to target those people through social networks, see if you can change their minds and influence the election, but also in the worst case scenario, you could drop people from those rosters, or you could add people who should not be in those rosters. The other way you can hack the election is certainly you can hack the voting software or the voting machine so that you vote, for example, for one candidate, but it turns out that your vote is cast for a different candidate. And that would be a travesty of the democratic system that we follow. Also, it's very simple. Some, some of the things are a little bit more subtle than that. There are claims that in some countries, for example, when one candidate, where one candidate had to be elected because it was the official candidate, that there were machines that were recording the votes correctly, but after a certain number of votes, they no longer recorded votes for the opponent. So that it looked like the results were good, but they had been tampered with. And then finally, um, you know, as they credit Stalin with saying, it is not the people who vote who win the elections, but it's the people who count the votes who win the election. If you are able to tamper with the counting of the votes, then you can also uh, alter the results of an election. Now, with all these risks, with many different machines, with 
the fact that in this country elections are run by the states, by law, and that the states have very different standards for cybersecurity and for technology, we're not near the point at which we are ready to do online elections. Uh, there's a conference in Las Vegas every summer called DEF CON for hackers. And in the last DEF CON conference, they set up a simulation of an electoral, electoral village. They replicated the websites of many of the electoral commissions of several states. In one case, a 13-year-old kid was able to hack that particular website within 10 minutes. So imagine when anybody with an interest in modifying the results of an election in this country could do if we choose to go that route. Remember that voting is very important. It has to be anonymous in the sense that people should not be able to track who you voted for, but it has to be accountable in such a way that we know that the vote counted in the right way, which is a very difficult problem. I once hired a Venezuelan who came to the United States as a refugee many years ago. And the reason why he came is because at the time when Chavez was president of Venezuela, they did a referendum where people could vote, do you want to keep Chavez in power or not? And people were free to vote, and they voted. But they kept the list of the identity documents of all the people who voted no. And every time any of those people were vying for a government contract or being, was hired by a multinational company to do work for the government, all of a sudden they were not welcome in the roster of workers. So because of how that person worked and voted, he had to leave his country and come to this country as a political refugee. So I want to end by with a question asking you to look forward into the future. When you think about 10 years from now, where do you see you know, issues of privacy and security? Where would you like them to be versus what do you think is realistic? Uh, I really think that, that privacy is fundamental for every human being. If you want to explore new things, if you want to grow as an individual, then you need privacy. You need to be able to watch really, really bad zombie movies because you like to watch them. <laughs> and neither the boss nor your friends should know about it unless you want them to know about it. And the same is true for all the things that we do when we're in a private setting. We need that space to sing in the shower without being criticized. Uh, we need uh, the ability to know that we're not being tracked at all times. Because otherwise we would be living in a police state. Now this is an argument that has been used many times before. In fact, the CEO of Google one used it, uh, Eric Schmidt, who said, well, if you're, not, you're doing something that you don't want anybody to know about, maybe you should not be doing that to begin with. And I disagree with that. There are many things that we do that we're not particularly happy that other people find out. And this is why we have to protect our privacy. And the way we protect that privacy is, once again, um, that four-pronged approach. Number one, critical thinking and personal choice in the way we, are, we use technology. That we push the technology companies to do the right thing. That we leverage the work of experts and civil society organizations and that we end up with good regulation, not just lots of regulation, just good regulation that is well enforced for those people who misbehave. And so my last question is, you're in an interesting position in an educational institution where you work both in you know, teaching students about these issues as well as in the applications of, of them. How do you see these two elements of you know, your work um, intersecting and informing the path forward? Well, I, I love teaching, um, and I think I'm making a um, difference in the lives of my students. When you think about cybersecurity, for example, by the latest count, there are about 3 million unfilled jobs worldwide in cybersecurity. So when I discover somebody who's got a passion for this, uh, it's quite joyful to help students develop that particular passion. 
No, sometimes it's worried because going back to my example with the World Cup, once they realize that they can make a half a million dollars by sending three emails, some of them start getting the wrong idea, which is also important uh, for me to teach them ethics in addition to uh, cybersecurity. So it's a great field. Uh, my goal is that eventually at Drexel, every student at Drexel, regardless of the field, will have to take a cybersecurity training. Right now it's voluntary and they get a certificate for doing so, and so do faculty and staff, but I think that in order to be good members of society, they need to take some cybersecurity training. For the students who are interested in um, this topic, um, it's quite interesting, really. Uh, there's always a risk that a very, very talented student will end up on the wrong side because there's a lot of money to be made. And the history of cybersecurity is full with people who started doing the right thing, then they went on to do the wrong thing. Then they collaborated with the FBI, but then they were moonlighting doing the bad thing, and now they're in a federal prison. So, you know. And it's very interesting. Some people will tell you, if you want to get a good job in cybersecurity, there are two avenues. One of them is study hard, get your bachelor's, your master's, your certifications, get some experience, and then eventually you get into a nice cybersecurity position. The other one is be a bad hacker, do something really bad but very creative, spend two years in a federal penitentiary, and then once you are finished with that, you'll be a consultant and you'll be paid a lot of money. <laughs> so, I strongly recommend the first <laughs> avenue because a federal penitentiary is not a good place to be no matter what the crime is. Well, great career advice to end on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.